Hello. I hope everybody is having a wonderful December. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in to Talks at Google. I'm very excited to introduce our guest, but before I do that, I want to throw it to the trailer for the upcoming movie, which, spoiler alert, has to do with the guest we have today. But I want to throw it to the trailer for the upcoming movie, Leave the World Behind. Take a look. I went online this morning and I rented us a beautiful house out by the beach. I figured if I made the reservation and packed our bags, it would eliminate most of the reasons to say no. Oh, this is nice. Kids look so happy. The Wi-Fi isn't working. Get a pad. I'm so sorry to bother you that this is our house. This is your house? We were driving back to the city, then something happened. You want to stay here, but we're staying here. We need to get them out of here. I need to think everything's going to be okay. Everything is going to be okay, isn't it? We are seeing ongoing cyber attacks across the country. Something is happening, and I don't trust them. Everything I know, I have told you. I don't believe you. I would do anything to protect my family. What you do is your business. Get in the car right now! You've been picking up on what's going on out there. Whatever it is, it's happening to all of us. I just want to know what is the truth. Well, if you like that trailer, and I, I cannot imagine that, that there's anyone in the world who didn't, but if you like that trailer, you're going to love our guest today. Our guest today is an Emmy-nominated Golden Globe winner, the creator of Comet, Angeline, Homecoming, Gaslit, Mr. Robot, and most recently, Leave the World Behind, a fellow East Coaster that I am very excited to talk to. Please welcome into the chat, Sam Esmail. Hey, guys. How are you? I'm well. How are you? I'm good. How many times have you seen that trailer now? Like 80, 100? Uh, way too many times. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I still do love it. Uh, that LCD sound system song always gets me. It's incredible. Well, and, and by the way, I, I'm going to try and fit in a, a, a question about all the amazing music that is featured in this movie. So prep for that. But I want to I want to start. I want to take it back before this movie a little bit. Sure. Um, your life has shown a remarkably consistent uh, balance and interest between technology and entertainment. I've kind of seen that across the board at a very young age. You mentioned that you'd started coding and you were also holding movie marathons. In college, you were majoring in computer science and film. Uh, and then we see in a lot of your projects, this balance between tech and entertainment uh, and in your career pivots as well. As you've navigated all of these pieces, how have you managed to balance those interests in a way where you're able to kind of feed both of those at, at the same time? Well, it, it really, it really wasn't me choosing that in a way. I mean, obviously I have an obsession with technology. I've had that curiosity about it since I was, you know, since I can remember since I was a little kid, but I think what happened was, you know, as I started to kind of venture into filmmaking, the world around me just rapidly changed because of technology in in ways that I don't even uh, that in ways that I don't even know if people are sort of necessarily uh, fully comprehending. And it, it it and and as sort of people evolved and as our sort of society evolved along with that in good or bad ways, um, I realized that as a as a as a filmmaker, my function is to tell stories 
about who we are and how we interact. And you can't do that, I think, in a contemporary context without addressing technology, because that's just been, I don't think there has been uh, a bigger impact on uh, humanity than technology. I really, I really believe that. Yeah, I, I I couldn't agree more. And I think and 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 we'll touch on the, the film shortly, but I think the film does a great job at, at at you know bringing up some of those questions as well. One of the things I find particularly interesting about you, as far as the tech and, and entertainment space goes, is uh, you made a career pivot where you were actually working at a tech company, leading a a, a tech company, having done a fundraising round, dot com boom, all of this stuff, and then you did make a. a I, I won't say hard, but I will say not soft, medium, medium over medium pivot, uh, uh, leaving technology and leading more with an entertainment foot first. Was that scary to make that kind of career transition to a industry that I would say is conservatively uh, less secure than maybe tech is? Oh, for sure. I mean, it's 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 one of the, I mean, I think I think it's actually um known that to break into the industry or to sell a, a spec script is you have a better chance of winning the lottery. Um, it's, it's, it's incredibly difficult. And, um, and especially if you don't have money, which I was, I was pretty broke out of film school. I, I was more than broke. I was, I was massively in debt. And, um, and, you know, I didn't have, I couldn't afford to film anything. I think nowadays with technology, it's gotten a lot cheaper to make shorts or even features, but at the time, um, you know, it required a lot of money. So I, I couldn't, I couldn't actually go out and direct. I had to actually do the cheapest thing I could do, which was to write. Um, but, um, but because I knew that that was um, what I, you know, what I've wanted to do since I was eight, like that was just my deep passion. I don't know where it came from, but that's. I just felt like I this is something I I had to do. It wasn't a question. I threw myself into it. But man, I remember, you know, I think I finally I made comment when I was like 35. I didn't make a lot of money off of that. I was a I was a little concerned that um, that this was going to be sustainable and that I was you know that I was going to be some 40 year old living with his mom still writing screenplays but i remember thinking i remember consciously thinking well then i'm just going to keep doing that until until it happens because that's how much i was sort of committed to this yeah and i mean i'll tell you listen my, my mother lives in florida and she does have extra room so if you ever do need that you can stay with my mom as well Great. i love that uh, yeah. yeah you know <laughs> um but it, yeah one of the things i also i i i found very uh cool about your story and, you know, I mentioned off the mic that, you know, I, I've, I've watched or, or listened to multiple interviews with you. And, and one thing I found cool about your story is that rather than when you graduated from film school, taking odd jobs, you took jobs in the industry where I imagine you 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 probably learned a lot more. I know you worked in post-production and you worked on a lot of stuff from reality television. You worked on a comedy documentary. You worked on a lot of different things. I wonder even though you were still pursuing writing and directing, I wonder in those jobs, were there any learnings or or kind of moments that seeped into your writing and, and who you became as a writer director? Well, I was in post a lot. And I have to say that was very uh, uh, key to understanding writing because that is the final rewrite. You've some of, you, some of you have probably heard that before, but um, it bears repeating because um, because when you when you when you have a script, the the thing about uh, words on a page is it's it's pretty flat. It's very uh, I mean it's literally I guess I mean I guess it's not literally one dimensional, but it's it has doesn't have the layers of music and and, and sound design and most importantly performance. Um, and that all kind of gets hashed out and refined in post. Um, and I and and that was to to be aware of that while you're writing the script in the first place. I thought I thought was really you know kind of key to me figuring out 
as a as a writer who I am as a filmmaker because not you know not every writer is going to go behind the camera and direct direct that script but I knew I was and so it really influenced how I I wrote scenes and how I and then more importantly how I rewrote scripts because it allowed me to kind of go through and, and start to hone in and cut down like an editor would in post so it so would you say that it it, it kind of gave you more creative freedom or did it give you better guardrails to be creative within i i think i think it was um i think it was you know it's i'll, I'll give you an example and maybe it's because maybe it's the guardrails but I, I but the example that i would use is you would you know i would write these scenes in these moments um and then and then i would reread the script and when I reread the script, because again, I'm thinking about it visually as a filmmaker, as a director, um, I'm watching it in my in my head, right? I'm I'm, I'm visualizing the scenes and the you know my my dream cast and um, and the the dream locations and the dream sets and um, and as I'm watching it um, and you know and it's like watching that first cut in the edit bay, you start to realize I don't need that moment, I don't need that beat. I don't need I can cut that I can go from here to here you just start to look at it as an editor and 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 so so I guess that's those are guardrails but in a way you're really kind of doing the first visual pass and as a director at least you're doing that first visual pass of what the film is going to look like and feel like that is yeah I, I feel like every I'm a writer myself and I feel like every writer could probably benefit from doing some post work yeah. um you know, I I found really interesting is that during that time you're working on screenplays, um, you wrote two different screenplays that made it on the blacklist. And for those who are watching that aren't familiar, the blacklist is a very coveted list to get on where, uh, you know, industry experts and agents, managers, all these kinds of people select the uh, yet produced, yet unproduced uh, uh, scripts uh, that they think are the best ones. You landed two uh, at two separate times on the blacklist. I guess my question for you is, you know, you 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 do this career pivot, you go to film school, you do these post production jobs. Now you've gotten two back to back scripts on the blacklist. Is that the moment where you start feeling, okay, I I can not only can I do this, I'm good at this. The industry and me have a future together. I would say that that's um, that was like getting the first golden ticket. Because um, when you're breaking in that way and people are actually having meetings with you, you know, studios are, are scheduling you to come in and, 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 um, and, and talk about projects and, and, what, and asking me what I want to do. Okay, well, that's never happened before. So that completely opened, it, it sort of got my foot in the door. The, the issue was, is that I wanted to direct. And remember, I started writing because that's the only thing I could afford to do. Um, so, so as much as I got my foot in the door, every time I would say I'd love to direct this script that is now on the blacklist and that apparently you all love, um, the door would get shut, and um, they'd be like, "Oh." Oh, you want to direct? Oh, that's not what we're interested in. And so the so I quickly had to adapt and say, okay, well, I guess I gotta just be a writer initially and take some odd jobs and try and work my way from that angle, um, and then just keep writing until until I could could find a way to finance and get something off the ground as a director. So it, it was it was sort of a, a a mixed bag, but ultimately it was in it was sort of. I mean, I, I've like that moment of just finally getting in the door to meet meet the Hollywood, you know, studios, and 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 that that was that was to me like the 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 first light at the end of the tunnel, if you want to call it that. No, yeah, I, I definitely understand that, um, and I I I have to I have to tell you, I'm going to get in trouble if I don't at least ask you one. Mr. Robot question. So I just, Perfect. I have to throw one out there um, because the, what the, Mr. Robot has such an unbelievable fan base that if, as I was kind of mentioning you earlier before we hopped on, if I go without asking a question, I'll get in trouble. So <laughs> let me ask you this. It started as a screenplay. 
Yeah. It became a pilot, a pilot that you somehow had the foresight to see going for four to five seasons. Since that TV show, it became a video game. It became a virtual reality experience. It became a book. Um, th this idea that started as a as a screenplay, given all of the ways that that Mr. Robot as an idea in your head has manifested into the world, do you feel like you told the story that you wanted to tell from the beginning? Did it change? And is there more story that that you still feel like exists? Well, so when I started writing Mr. Robot, it was a feature. I was actually not that interested in TV back then. Um, and, you know, it was a feature that went really long. Um, speaking about my editorial influence, that was not helping me <laughs> with that script. Um, because I kept, when I kept in, I think it was when I in, invented the Terrell character that I just started going off on tangents in his storyline. And I started to think, okay, what am I doing here? This this, this is getting way too uh, out of control. And there was no way I was going to be able to contain this to a feature. Um, but um, but before I started writing it, I knew the ending. I, I, I sort of mapped out in my head. I don't outline. I sort of, it all sort of is in my brain. So I'd live, been living with Elliot for a while. Um, and then I started coming up with Darlene and, and, and Shayla and Angela, and I started to kind of piece together the world. And, um, and, I, and I sort of knew the first act and I knew the third act and everything in between was something that I wanted to discover as I was writing. But because I went off on tangents, um, uh, my, my uh, uh, producing partner, Steve Golan, um, he at the time was uh, about, I think True Detective was about to come out. And he, he was the one that sort of wisely suggested to, to, to pivot to TV. And, and then I saw True Detective and I saw how sort of cinematic it was and, um, and, and, and how like, you know, because, because Mr. Robot is not, was not built as a television show, it showed me that you could still tell a sort of close-ended storyline within a sort of serialized format, like a, like a TV series. So um, it was for, for all those reasons, I was able to wrap my head around turning Mr. Robot into, into the series. Now, having said that, so the, I did know the ending um, and I, and I, and I knew that that's what we were building the entire time, but, but, but I also knew I didn't know the middle. And that was when I, I needed the help of my incredibly talented writers in the room to kind of break the story as we went along, but we were always building uh, to that finale. That's incredible. Um, yeah. I also really appreciate the, um, the confidence that you had in yourself to be like, I can tell this story in that way, um, which I'm sure you'll never, you know, you'll be like, Oh, stop. But genuinely, I think it's, it's so impressive. Um, I, 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 also I can wanted... just say, can I just say, it really wasn't confidence. I, I was just to be honest with you. It was I had no, I didn't know of any other way to do it. Um, I remember there were moments where that you know the network did not want me to end the show. They wanted me to keep it going, <laughs> and um, and I, I just I remember moments where I, um, I just said I don't know how. I mean, I don't know how. I mean, this is the end. We have to get to the end, and I can't just you know I can't just keep keep going off on these like sort of sideways storylines. So, um, so it was, it, I mean, I appreciate the compliment, but it was, it was more out of ignorance than anything. No, I, whatever it was, uh, clearly it struck a nerve with the world. Um, <laughs> but I, I want to just in the interest of time, I, I have to jump to leave the world behind, um, which I had the chance to watch. And I, I said this to you earlier, but, um, I don't always love everything that I watch, um, but I certainly did love this. Uh, this is a movie that touches on tons of different themes, uh, technology and our dependence on it, uh, race, uh, politics. It really starts running the gamut of a lot of things. My question for you is a lot of times when you are watching movies that have a lot of those themes, they can hit viewers over the head and it can start muscling out the actual story. In your case, you found an incredible balance and I never felt that way. Um, as a, a as you were adapting this, as you were directing it, were you always keeping an eye on the balance of 
making sure that had an engaging story while also kind of answering the questions you wanted to with the themes? Well, you know, theme is interesting because I, I feel like I feel like the conversation about what you know what the story is really trying to say should be had very early on and then sort of put to the side. Um, because if you start letting that contaminate the characters who are supposed to be these, you know, real people that you can identify with and with feelings and who are, you know, complex and full of contradictions, um, you don't want them to turn into mouthpieces for you as a filmmaker or the theme of the story. You really want them to sort of live and breathe like like people and interact um, with through emotion. And honestly, you don't want to intellectualize the experience either. The idea of you watching a film um, is that it hits you on a guttural level, um, not as much in the head. The head part, it comes after. And so the, for me, the theme was talked about with myself and, and the rest of my department heads fairly early on, but it was all sort of in the context of subtext. And then we were, and then we were like, okay, now we're on set. We are here to tell a story about these people. And, um, and, and really nothing should um, interfere with that. But, um, but, but because we've done our jobs, right, jobs, right up front in including what that kind of, uh, I, I don't even want to say message, but that sort of overall takeaway that um, that we're, what Ramon kind of beautifully did in the book. Um, hopefully, there's it, you can kind of feel it on a on a on a real subtextual level um, rather than think it because I, I I think it I think if 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 it if it turns into like more of an esoteric kind of approach, it won't land as well. Um, so so so. Um, yeah, I would argue th th that um, theme is not as important when you're actually executing uh, when you're actually executing the story. It sh it shouldn't be a front of mind. It should be something really kind of deep down, you know. Yeah, and I I, I think you know, and, and I'm not going to spoil anything, but there there are moments like like there's one moment, for example, and this is kind of a nothing moment, but there's a moment where you know someone's uh, uh, Google Maps you know, isn't working. Right. And and I remember thinking to myself, like, man, I've, I've, I've lived in LA for a while. For the first several years I lived here, I just relied on it. I didn't learn how to get anywhere. Right. Um, and, and what's weird is, you know, the day after I watched that movie, that I couldn't shake that idea to me that like, how come I had never analyzed my own behavior in those regards and, you know, and, and thought a little more thoroughly about what that maybe meant or what I was refusing to, to, to do as a result of that. So I, I, yeah, I completely understand. And I, and as I mentioned before, I don't think you hit anyone over the head, but those themes to me stayed with me. Um, and that was, that was very valuable for me outside of just enjoying the film, that that was super valuable for me. Um, but I want to ask you about the visual style. Okay. Now I know everyone who's watching this, you probably haven't seen this movie yet, or if you're watching this after you've seen it, you'll appreciate this question. Uh, you developed one of the most interesting visual styles I have seen on a movie in a long time. Wow. Uh, you created the feeling uh, almost like a claustrophobic feeling in a lot of places. Uh, you were, you know, using these these medium close ups a lot of the time, static shots where they needed to be. Uh, uh, and these overall, there were these hard pushes in uh, uh, that you did that to me, the film would have been a completely different film without that. Um, the the circles that you created in a lot of those shots, this would have just been a different movie. And I think uh, uh, not as impactful of a film. So I guess my question to you as someone who, who you know, was adapting and directing, when did you first start coming into the idea of this visual style needs to be so distinct to do this story justice? And how am I going to achieve it? Oh, interesting. Well, first of all, thank you. Those are all very kind words. Uh, listen, I, I for me, I don't um, I don't come into uh, any project thinking how do I distinct distinctly visualize this. Um, it really has to come from the story, and and honestly, more more than that, the characters um, and and sort of their emotional journey. And and I remember. Uh, 
I remember the first time, obviously, I know you, I know um, uh, people watching this haven't, haven't, haven't seen the film yet, but there's a shot where um, Julia's character, Julia Roberts' character, Amanda, is uh, is kind of going through that this house that she's rented for the weekend, and she's, you know, been desperate to get away, and here she finally is at this beautiful home, and um, and she just starts to walk around and explore it and go up the stairs and go to the bedroom, and um, and you know, Todd Campbell and I, we we have such a secondhand now. We've worked together ever since the first season, of Mr. Robot. We've worked on everything, and we always start with um, the point of view, and not just her literal point of view, but her sort of emotional be you know state of mind. And we knew that Amanda was you know kind of enamored with this home and there was a dizzying kind of effect that we wanted we wanted to sort of uh draw the audience into and, and and kind of align with her on that and so the camera starts to swoop around and kind of you know circle around her as she's taking in the house and i remember when we we were pre-visiting it and pre all pre is it's kind of software that lets you kind of simulate what this would look like with sort of some rough animation just to see how it would feel. And I remember when we first did it, it was a little kind of soft and I was like, okay, I kind of, I kind of actually felt weirdly ostentatious. It kind of felt self-conscious. Like I was more watching the camera than I was understanding how I was supposed to feel about it. So we kept pushing it and pushing it until it became the shot that's in the film. And I remember when we kept pushing it, it kept, it weirdly kept being, almost too ostentatious, too showy. But the more we did that, the more sickening it started to feel. And that's when I knew that the, the, that that was right, because as much as Amanda's character in this moment is taking in this beautiful home, the movie is setting up the tone that something's off, that something's about to go awry. And that was just a matter of us looking at this image and starting to realize the feeling that we want to get. And it really starts from there. It's like, what is that visceral experience you're trying to deliver to the audience that matches where you are in the story? Um, and if you, you know, every time we thought about any of the camera angles or any of the camera moves, it started from that place. And there are, there are moments, like I remember in Mr. Robot, we did this a little bit in the movie, um, where it's not a camera move it's a locked off shot and it's just about composition and you know in mr robot we you know we kind of notoriously did a shot where we put our characters in the lower third of the frame and it's very off kilter and just by doing that it was unsettling and kind of um conjured this feeling in the audience that put you in the mindset of Elliot and sort of his sort of disjointed view of or, or outlook of the world. And so that's that's sort of that same conversation Todd and I had with every shot in this film. Yeah, I mean, the, I, I I did notice there's a bottom third shot with Mahershala Ali and, and the wonderful <laughs> actress um, who plays his daughter uh, that, where that was in the bottom third. And I, I recognized it <laughs> um, in, in, a, in a great way. Uh, but yeah, no, I, I, it's so funny. I, I, uh, to give you a little peek behind the curtain, um, I, so I take notes during these movies before these talks, and I literally wrote in my notes, uh, Julia Roberts horror, uh, music video. That's what <laughs> I wrote because that's kind of what it feels like as she's walking through. Because in the in the audio mix, it's the song and nothing else until she until she kind of hops on the bed, and that's when that you know the actual uh, the mix changes. But I remember watching this and I was like holy cow, like, I don't know how to feel, but I'm uncomfortable. And I knew that's what you wanted me to feel. Exactly, exactly. And that that's, that's all there is to it when it comes to figuring out the camera, because the camera is the window for the audience to um, be invited into this experience. So what you do with it is so paramount. And, you know, one thing Todd and I, uh, like, understand about each other is that we never take a you know, we never take that for granted. I think, I'll, you know, you can fall into a trap as a filmmaker of just getting coverage, you know, just you know, getting it over shoulder, you know, she's walking up the stairs, okay, you just grab a shot where you pan up the stairs. Um, and you're just sort of basically just telling the beats of the story, but no one, no one gets involved in the movie just because you're following 
the beats of something. It's not about the logic or plot. It's like you said, it's about the feeling and the nightmare that you're sort of dragging, uh, dragging the audience through. That's the experience that they're really craving. And so the way to do that is really, or well, one of the ways to do that, I should say, because there's many ways to do that. But when it comes to camera, you gotta, you gotta always consider that before you decide what you want to do with it. Yeah, you know, the, the other thing I noticed that you were doing as far as the shots go is there's a really delicate balance of uh, practical and CGI effects. Um, there is, I don't want to give anything away, so I'm going to tread carefully here, but, you know, you you, you blend them in, in certain shots. Um, there are some action sequences where uh, there's a lot of stuff going on that, that is practical, um, you know, and then there's CGI in other shots. Again, for anyone who's listening, if I sound like I don't know what I'm talking about, I'm just trying not to share anything with you. Um, you're doing good, good Josh. But, but I guess I, thank you. Um, I, I'm going to, I'm going to let every, all my friends know Sam Esmail thinks I'm doing good. Um, but no, but, but genuinely, as you look at this blend, um, as you're approaching a project like this and you're thinking, I want this to be authentic to somebody. I want this to look good now. And I want this to look good 10 years from now. You know, how do you strike that, that balance between, I want, you know, the CGI and the practical and the costs of each and how to blend them in? That's a very good question because I mean I've not uh, I've not used as much CGI as I as I as I did on this film on any anything I've done before and it's it was it was tricky for me because it's hard for me I'm such a uh, uh, visual filmmaker that it's hard for me to um, shoot something and have to rely on other people months or potentially a year down the road to actually kind of fully realize what I'm actually seeing in the frame. But the difference here was, uh, and, and I, this all kind of started in the book, um, but we completely committed to it in the film, which is that unlike most disaster films where the spectacle is the main for kind of thrust of the story that you're really coming there for the action and the characters sort of tend to be secondary um we sort of inverted that process and really this film is about these people and the disaster elements are sort of pushed off in the distance so with all of those set pieces you know what i really um uh, what i really uh focused on was lingering on our characters and how and how what they're seeing um, is is impacting us more than the than the thing itself. And honestly, that's like, you know, when I thought about it in that way, it's you know, it, it harkens back to what Spielberg did with Jaws. I mean, Jaws, you know, is an interesting case study about this because famously Spielberg couldn't get the shark puppet to work, and there were initially it was it, he was going to film that shark a lot of uh, you know for a lot of the movie and he couldn't couldn't get it to work it kept malfunctioning so he had to resort to really kind of staying on his characters and and only seeing glimpses of the shark but the movie was all the better for it um and that kind of lesson was something that i i felt just in you know hitchcock films um, he kind of really um, famously uh, was really great with character and really was about uh, about them and their reaction. Ver and, but there was still spectacle and the film was still had the scope, but it was also intimate. And, you know, once you kind of as a filmmaker align yourself with your people, with the people that are in your movie, um, it makes those sequences um, a, a lot more relatable and therefore a lot more terrifying. Because look, I love an a, a good action film uh, as much as the, the next person, but um, when I'm watching John Wick do some crazy shit, um, I'm not relating to that because there's no way in hell am I gonna go through that. So it's a fun ride, but there's a detachment to it um, because I, I'm removed from that. I'm not I'm not as aligned with the characters as, uh, as, uh, as I can be. And so with this kind of film, um, we felt it was really important um, and 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 just way more uh, terrifying, honestly, to be with our characters who are incapable of doing anything that John Wick can do, just like I'm incapable of doing anything that uh, that that our, even our characters in our film go through, and that we're experiencing these sort of elements or these sort of set pieces through their eyes.
Yeah, I mean, I just want to be clear. I, I am very capable of doing everything that John Wick does, <laughs> and um, I'm I'm just I, I'm going to let you speak for you, I, but that's that's me. You know what? I believe you, Josh. I believe you. I would I would want you by my side in case shit goes down. Thank you. I'm Josh Wick. That's what I <laughs> am now. Um, but uh, no, I I I completely appreciate th that you you stuck with the characters because I do think with everything going on in the world in this film, my dread came far more from the interactions of the characters than anything else. Yeah. And, you know, you mentioned uh, uh, Hitchcock just now. Um, there was obviously a very nice tip of the cap to Hitchcock in this, in this film. And anyone who's familiar with Hitchcock, you'll, you'll spot it. Um, but also it feels like uh, you captured the same kind of uh, dread and tension. I remember feeling watching the movie rope, um, just, just really hammering that home when you were meeting with your cast, uh, who, by the way, for those that, you know, maybe didn't pay attention to the trailer or haven't read about this, this is arguably one of the most intimidating casts I think you could put together. I mean, you've got Julia Roberts, Ethan Hawke, Mahershala Ali, Kevin Bacon, you know, and not to mention all the incredibly talented, uh, uh actors and actresses that, that, that played the, you know, the two daughters and the son. Um, but when you approached this powerhouse of acting group, did you say to them, this is kind of the vibe I'm going for. I do want to get some like kind of Hitchcock, Hitchcocky intention. I, I want to feel these things. Let's all work as a team to do that. Or did you kind of just say, do what you need to do and, and we'll, we'll make it happen. Yeah. So when you, when, as a director, when you're lucky enough to have a ridiculously talented stack cast, like I, like I did on this film, your 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 only job on set is really to try and uh uh stay out of their way because they're they're just of a caliber that um that you they don't they don't need um they just need they just need room to to do their work um and you just have to figure out a way to, uh to do that and create that and still pull off all the all the um the, the the shots and the production design and the visual grammar of the film but in terms of tone you, you know yes you can have conversation and we and we did i i, I spoke to uh obviously all of my cast members we did two weeks of rehearsal um before we started shooting because they actually drove a lot of how we wanted to film and how we wanted to set design the, the uh the movie because um again it really starts with that it really starts with how do you guys want to move in this space? What is the blocking going to feel like? How are you emotionally kind of having these power plays? Um, because this is this is the CGI of the movie. I mean, this is the special effect of the movie is are these actors going at it? Um, so the way I want to kind of, to me, communicate the tone that I'm going for is play music. Um, that's how that's how I write. Um, uh, and and what? I was lucky enough because Mac Quayle, my composer, who I also work have worked with since the, the first season of Mr. Robot, uh, who's a brilliant composer. Um, you know, I spoke to him about music in this film in the writing stage. Um, uh, so way, but you know, typically, I think a film filmmakers what they do is they temp music. I mean, I, I used to do this too. You temp music in post, and you give that to the composer, and they, they sort of use that as a guide. But um, but for here, I just wanted. I wanted Mac to just get going. So I had all these pieces of music that he just started creating while we were shooting the movie, which is sort of unheard of. And I would just play it on set. Um, and that more than anything, just starts, not just the cast, just the in crew. It, it starts to kind of, um, uh, uh, it starts to engender this tone that we're all kind of striving for. And it put it makes you feel it in your body as opposed to in your head, and you can see that the camera operator is now moving uh, with the music and with the you know sort of rhythm of the music, and the cast is doing the same, and so their headspace is kind of reoriented into the type of movie that we're making. Um, so I, I I'm a huge proponent of because to me music to me is like an infusion of tone. It's just immediately once you hear a piece of uh, a, a, a string or a guitar or drum beat or whatever it is, um, it just immediately tells you what you're feeling. I mean, it could kind of, it just kind of elucidates it in a really kind of impactful and quick way. So th that, that was the key for me to, to kind of, uh, set the, set the, set the, 
uh, set the tone for the for the for you know, again the entire set, everyone on the set. Yeah, and and I won't spoil it, but what I will say is um, there's a needle drop from the late '90s R&B era that will blow everyone's minds. Um, <laughs> that comes in there where I was just like, I'm sorry, what now? <laughs> um, but um, one thing I noticed, uh, I, I'm I I like to watch the credits of, of everything um, I watch. I love that you did a, cre a credit sequence in this, um, and it felt it was kind of like Hitchcock and James Bond and all the super fun stuff. Um, but there were two interesting names <laughs> in your credits that stuck out to me, and I can tell you know where I'm going with this. Mm -hmm. um, can we have a quick story about how this ended up being executive produced by Barack and Michelle Obama? Uh, sure. I mean, again, I just got really lucky, um, but I'll kind of walk you through what happened. I mean, you know, we sold the film to Netflix, which is where um, President Obama's company hired High Round Productions um, is where their deal is at. And um, and uh, I had known that President Obama is a huge fan of Julia Roberts and they had, you know, they kind of met over the years. And, um, and you know, he's a huge fan of the book. The book was on his reading list that year, the year it came out. Oh, and right. and a, little, uh, a little story I'll share. Um, during the second season of Mr. Robot, while we were editing, um, President Obama was in the White House at the time, and um, when we got and uh, got a note from the White House saying President Obama is a huge fan of Mr. Robot, can you send them rough cuts of the second season before they aired? And uh, and of course, my mind was blown. Right, I had no idea uh, that he was a fan of the show. Um, so so I had known he was a fan of mine as well. And so it was like for all those reasons, it sort of made sense that um that that you know his production company called up and said we'd love to be a part of this if you if you think uh if you think it'd be helpful uh a helpful partnership and of course you know me and my producing partners were like yeah we'll, we'll <laughs> yeah if one of the most brilliant minds on the planet wants to give us his insight into the script and the movie um uh, we'll, we'll 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 be happy to take it so yeah it was it been a very surreal highlight of my career yeah i can't even imagine when he asked for <laughs> rough guts of season two of you just being like well you can tell president obama to wait till we're done <laughs> like what <laughs> um, course, you know, by the way it made me par it made me then like paranoid about how every rough cut had to be perfect then which is like not the point of a rough cut you know no I mean? <laughs> oh my gosh i can't even imagine that you just like you know you go home to your family they're like how was your day you're like oh i gotta send these rough cuts to president obama um <laughs> that's crazy um i i i want to ask you briefly about kind of the commentary on on technology in this movie yeah Right now, one of the biggest conversations across the globe is AI, artificial intelligence, and how it's working into our everyday lives. Um, this particular movie feels like it makes pretty strong commentary on our society's dependence on technology, which I think is only going to grow as we continue to incorporate AI. When you started going into this film, did you have feelings about technology and how it interacts in our lives? And after filming it, did your feelings on that change? I don't think technology interacts in our lives. I think we use technology to interact in our lives. And that's 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 always been my belief about tech is I'm not a technophobe. I, I think I think technology is agnostic. It has no morality to it. It's the human side of it that I'm more fascinated with. And um and uh, and for me, that was what the book did so well. And then when I grab so the book didn't really you know, sort of have the cyber attack elements that um, that's in the film that I that, that was sort of my contribution. And um, and I just took it from a place of I really tried to kind of detangle that a little bit. And so because I really do think that um, that it's our sort of complicity or our sort of um, interest in how we use tech that will in, in the case of the film, kind of offer a cautionary tale of what could happen to our world if we go one way or the other with it. And so that that was what I was more uh, fixated on. Our reliance on it also speaks to, you know, we were talking about Google Maps earlier. Um, you know, 
I couldn't get around without my GPS. I mean, I'll be, I'll be completely frank with you. I'd be completely lost. Now, what does that mean for the rest of civilization if suddenly technology has become this huge crutch that we, we not only couldn't maybe get around, I mean, that's GPS, but are we able to still interact with our friends and family when that's so been replaced with social media? Um, can we, can we, can we still have um, um, sort of a, a functioning uh, and, and a community uh, without technology? And that's where I think that those were where, to me, my, my mind went to these really interesting questions about, should we be pausing and taking a step back and trying to understand the value of, of, of real life interaction and, and how technology could supplement that, not replace it? And 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 I think those are the sort of moral quandaries that the film explores. Well, I mean, listen, we are technically using technology to communicate, but this does also feel like a real world world interaction. So it is nice. <laughs> um, I think that's about as good of a note as any to to end on. Um, Sam, thank you so much for coming. Um, everyone that is watching this. Uh, if it hasn't come out yet, uh, watch Leave the World Behind when it does. If you're watching this after it came out, go watch it again. <laughs> um, you know, but but Sam, from the bottom of my heart, thank you. I thought it was a wonderful film and it really was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. Thank you.